Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to continue on with Karl Marx's Capital with, this is episode 3, which is going to cover part 4, with his, which is chapters 12 to 15. Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. It helps me out a lot. If you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find me on YouTube where I sometimes release videos. Or if you found me on YouTube, you'll be able to find me in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribing would obviously help. Most of the people that listen aren't subscribed, so do that so you see videos I release every single week, sometimes twice a week if uh, you're listening to this on YouTube. And you can help me out via Patreon or PayPal if you want to, but obviously no pressure. Okay. Don't want to waste any more of your time with that. Let's start with chapter four, or continue on with part four, sorry. Part four, the production of relative surplus value, which begins with chapter 12, the concept of relative surplus value. So he begins this by discussing the distinction between absolute and relative surplus value. So absolute surplus value just refers to the amount of surplus value that is extracted from workers. Relative surplus value, however, is going to be the proportion between the surplus value extracted from workers and the value or the necessary labor that is conducted by workers so that they may live, uh, they may earn enough to live and keep working. So as we said in the last episode, if a worker needs to work four hours in order to cover the necessary cost of living, but they're working more than that, they're working let's say eight hours, then four hours are gonna be spent doing necessary labor and four hours is gonna be surplus labor. And that is where the capitalist is able to extract surplus value from the worker. So in this case, the relative surplus value will be the proportion four to four. Four hours spent on necessary labor, four hours on surplus labor, which means a relative surplus value of 100%. So if we wanted to increase the relative surplus value, we would need to make more time dedicated to surplus labor and less time dedicated to necessary labor, what the worker needs to do in order to survive. So we want, or the capitalist wants, I should say, more money, more time to be spent earning them profit, earning them money above what it is costing them to have the worker there. Now the absolute surplus value or absolute surplus labor can be increased in a pretty simple way and that is by just increasing the length of the working day. So in the example I just gave, in an eight hour, eight hour workday, four hours might be spent on necessary labor, four hours spent on surplus labor. So if we were to increase that workday by let's say two hours to make it 10 hours, still, assuming wages stay the same and everything, four hours are spent for the worker to earn that money uh, in order to live, but then that is extended out over 10 hours, which means that six hours is spent exploiting the worker instead of four previously. Now, I want to say that it isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship like that, or in the case of eight hours, four hours spent being exploited, four hours not. It can be a lot less than that. The exploitation can be a lot less than that, or it can be a lot more, you know, just using this example to make the, the math really easy to understand. Because in every single case, in a factory setting, in a relationship between capitalists and workers, there's going to be exploitation. That is, more is going to be taken out of the worker than is given back. And the reason for that is that if that weren't the case in this system, the capitalist wouldn't be able to make a profit and the business wouldn't be allowed to flourish. It wouldn't be able to grow at all. It wouldn't be able to do anything. It would just break even. So it wouldn't grow and it would eventually, by virtue of that, it would crumble. So relative surplus value can also be affected in a number of other ways besides just lengthening the working day, which will mostly just add to the absolute surplus value, the actual intensity, the number, I should say, of exploitation if we attribute a number to that. It would change the proportion so more time is spent absolutely exploiting the worker. Now relative surplus value can change just by, for example, keeping the same eight hour workday, but introducing machinery that is going to make workers more productive. So that means then that workers can earn their keep in as I said earlier, in maybe two hours as opposed to four. They're earning that much in, uh, in order to cover the cost of their survival in two hours instead of four, so the capitalists can then get more out of the worker for their time than uh, previously. 
because if at first it took a worker eight hours to make a coat, maybe now they can make it in, um, they can make two coats in eight hours, all the while the person is still being paid more, or sorry, is uh, still being paid the same, whereas the capitalist is now earning more money because they now have two coats to sell. So the exploitation then is much greater. So in this case where production becomes more efficient, things can be made for cheaper. So the capitalist can now sell the coats for maybe less than just double. So if he has or they have two coats, they might sell them at a little bit less than one coat twice in order to be competitive. So let's say, for example, in eight hours they were to make uh, one coat previously, and they sell that coat for $10. Now they, can, now, now they can make two coats in the same amount of time. Instead of charging $20, because that would be just the, I guess, um, 10 plus 10, perhaps they could then sell it for $19 and undercut competitors and, and whatever. But in this process, with the general uh, rendering of more efficient production, the cost of goods can come down. And what happens then is if this affects basic necessities, like basic food, whatever that might be, bread, um, you know, producing other kinds of things in factories, maybe even acquiring like fruit, growing vegetables in agricultural zones that are run under uh, the capitalist system. If the prices of these goods can come down, then that means the capitalists can get away with paying their workers less in order to exploit them more. So if previously it cost, let, I'm just going to use random numbers here, it cost $10 a day for the worker to earn enough to live. Now, with the prices of things coming down, let's say the price of all goods came down by uh, half. Now it only needs, uh, the worker only needs $5 in order to uh, keep living. So the capitalist is going to respond to this by bringing down wages, knowing very well that they don't need to pay their workers that amount, and then they're able to spend more time extracting uh, more money extracted from the workers in order to proffer up profits to make profits grow at an even faster rate. And that puts us here into chapter 13 titled Cooperation. So in order for capitalism to be capitalism and not, for example, serf labor or feudalism, or any other kind of labor, any other kind of economic system, it demands a mass of free people exploited in the production of commodities. So under capitalism, so the story goes, what you have is a mass of free people who are selling a commodity, and that commodity is their labor, who they are selling or that they are selling to um, an owner of property, an owner of business, a capitalist, who then uses that labor that commodity to earn them more money. So this is that going back to the formula in the, one of the previous episodes where you buy a commodity to make money, which will then earn you more money at the end of the day. Or you spend money on a commodity, that is labor, which will then earn you money prime, more money. Now, interestingly, Marx is quite firm in the fact that the shift from older forms of economic uh, production older uh, economic systems, if I can call them economic, just for the sake of uh, brevity, maybe for the sake of uh, making my life easier. The difference between those systems and capitalism is less a qualitative one than it is a quantitative one, which is an interesting point, at least f for me, because similar, uh, similar elements, similar forms of ex exploitation can be seen much earlier, be it in the history of slavery or in serf labor or any other kind of system like that. What we see are people with wealth, commanding people without wealth in order to earn those people with wealth more wealth. And this isn't every single economic system, absolutely not, if I can call them economic. Of course, there were other forms of exchange, other forms of production, if I can call them production, uh, agriculture that precede these types of exploitation. Uh, so just wanna make that entirely clear. But the ones that we're discussing here that supposedly predate capitalism, like feudalism, and of course, you know, serf labor and, and all that, and, and slavery, these sorts of systems very much set the stage for, to, in some measure, for the type of capitalistic exploitation that we would see emerge in the 16th, 17th centuries in Europe. So the shift to capitalism for Marx is less a shift 
an entire qualitative shift of the system itself, but um, an intensification of those logics that crystallized into capitalism because of an accumulation of a certain mass of individuals that were freed up, and I put freed in air quotes, freed up to work for somebody else en masse. So previously we would have things like guilds, for example, and in a guild people would be trained uh, into a specific field. They'd be trained to do one specific thing, maybe, maybe carpentry, and that would be their skill. They would still, in the guild, be you know working for somebody else they would have to do apprenticeship apprenticeships and all that but under these systems everything was quite regulated and controlled that is there was government regulation there were institutional regulations that sought to maintain people on a very strict path with this system under capitalism and we're going to talk about this more as we go on here what we began to see was the liberation from these types of control these types of regulations in favor of more uh, so-called liberty, so people could choose where to work. And the division of labor and the introduction of other means of production and other techniques of production allowed it so that less and less training was required to do the tasks that were going to be done, going to need to be done, so nearly anyone could do it. And this would also give way to introducing children, introducing at the time women into production that would uh, exploit that the system could exploit all that much more but we're going to talk about this a little bit more I just wanted to give a little bit of a uh, background to that now a mass of workers are able to do more than simply the sum of their parts that is with a group of people you can do more than each one of them combined uh, at least each one of their skills combined together and that is because there's a certain uh, allowance afforded by more people that extends beyond like I said, the sum of their parts. But with the mass, with a mass of people comes also a very prominent threat of retaliation. Because if you have a group of people being run by a single person, the group might not totally agree with what that single person has to say. And so the capitalist must assume the form of a kind of despot at this time. That is, they need to be someone that is going to manage and closely control the people. And here we also see I think it's safe to say the emergence of a kind of, uh, you know, white collar position within factories that was meant to manage, you know, the supervisor would emerge, the manager would emerge, who serves a kind of intermediary role between workers and owners. And later on, he'll come to say that with this type of cooperation that we would see in factories, for example, or we would see previous to that in agricultural production, be it under surf labor or anything like that, this kind of cooperation would start to disintegrate with the introduction of machinery and with the uh, intensification of the division of labor. And that puts us here into chapter 14, the division of labor and manufacture. So manufacturing and manufacture originates in two ways. There are two things that kind of potentiate it. And that is how previously separated workers are now brought together under single roof where each does a specific job. So we think of a factory here, each working on a, a single machine or a different, uh, different parts of a, a machine and, and so on. And also the fact that there's a kind of totally, the introduction of totally atomized work. So you're kind of trained to do this one uh, task and you will do that task in the factory and that, that will be your job. And here we start to see the emergence, even though its roots could be seen earlier than this, of the division of labor. So now instead of having one person make a coat, you now have one person make the zipper, one person put together the fabric, one person do the sewing of the pockets or whatever else goes on it, and, and you know, uh, divide up those tasks however you want. But with this process, with the introduction of this possibility, suddenly production could happen much more efficiently, more people could be employed, which also meant that more people had disposable income to buy the things that they were making ostensibly so he uh, kind of characterizes it like this he says on the one hand machinery manufacture arises from the combination of various independent trades which lose that independence and become specialized to such an extent that they are reduced to merely supplementary and partial operations in the production of one particular commodity on the other hand it arises from the cooperation of craftsmen in one particular handicraft 
It splits up that handicraft into various detailed operations, isolating these operations and developing their mutual independence. So here we just think of the ways of someone being trained to do a specific task. Let's say you hire someone who has even previous training in carpentry. The factory owner will say, oh, we need someone who's going to make chairs that we're going to assign you to do that in this setting. And you're going to be among, you know, someone over there who's making a table or whatever, another carpenter doing that. Maybe we have someone else who's uh, working on a machine, building nails and so on. But in this system, in this close relationship with the means of production, be they tools or machinery or whatever that emerge within manufacturing and alongside manufacturing, what we see is a general degradation or uh, a de-evolution of humanity to the form of a robot. And I don't think that there's a coincidence that the term robot, I think from Czech, I want to say Czech, is uh, means slave. And the human has to then work alongside machinery to match that machine, to work as fast as the machine, to become, in Marx's words, a kind of organ of the machine, an appendage of the machine, an extension of the machine. And so there's a kind of monotony involved where working with the machine just puts you into a certain rhythmic mode of being, one in which you are matching the rhythms of the machine because that's all the machine knows. The machine only knows rhythms, the same rhythm every single day. And what that does, according to Marx, is it disturbs the intensity and flow of a man's vital forces. Vital being kind of life forces, their own innate human uh, forces, their capacities. So then he describes two forms of the division of labor. It's not super important, but I'm going to lay it out anyways, where there is heterogeneous and organic. Heterogeneous implies a chain of successive specialists working on a thing, whereas organic collapses these successive operations and instead performs all the operations simultaneously. So heterogeneous might look like this, where uh, I put together the sole of a shoe and then I hand it off to somebody else who uh, is going to, I don't know, put the fabric on the rest of the shoe and then somebody else who's going to put the shoelaces in, whatever. Whereas now with uh, organic, the organic division of labor, you have masses of people putting together soles of shoes, which then transfer over to a number of people putting together the fabric on the shoe. Meanwhile, as that next operation is being conducted, I've already begun again to do the soles of the shoes uh, one more time. So I am not an expert in the production of shoes, neither is anybody else in this organic system. Instead, we are all just cogs in a machine of putting together this shoe. Now, one of the other benefits of the division of labor for the capitalist is that it requires, as I mentioned earlier, significantly less training for workers which means that less money or more money can be saved by the capitalist on the worker so that they can keep more for themselves. But it would be wrong to think that the division of labor was just introduced with capitalism. Many of its logics can be seen beforehand, and this is just the nature of cooperation to some extent, where some people are going to be more proficient at, let's say, hunting. Maybe some people are going to be more proficient at building things, maybe more people at gathering, maybe more people at cooking, and so on. And we see this in Plato as well, right back to the Republic, where he's describing how some people are just going to be better at some things. And the task of a perfect society is to encourage those successive uh, or those, those productive attributes of each individual person in order to make the system run, the society run as fluidly as possible. And this is in itself a kind of division of labor, but it happens on a much different extent, a much less intense extent then we see with the emergence of manufacturing and with capitalist exploitation. And so while some of these logics can be seen, this, that is this logic of the division of labor can be seen before capitalism. And this also, you know, we see it in guilds as well, in other apprenticeship, um, in other forms of production like that. While we see the division of labor forming in those places, these older economic systems had certain safety guards against the crystallization of capitalism. For example, guilds would limit the number of workers that could work there. Uh, you would have um, a limiting of the so-called free circulation of merchant capital and so on, because there was a kind of fear 
of the possibility of capitalism taking over. And we get a lot of this as well, or I think in my mind, some of the best, one of the best approaches to this issue comes out of Deleuze and Guattari when they describe the ways in which older state systems would ward off the emergence of states because they feared what states were capable of. Now that's a totally a side point that's just meant for people who happen to already know about the, those ideas. It's not important to understand Marx, but here the point I want to accentuate is just that these logics seem to come before capitalism, but at the same time and at the same time, they were warded off. They were fought away so that capitalism itself would not culminate into a full-fledged system. And also, besides there being actual restrictions put in place, at that time, the division of labor in these previous economic systems was just incapable at commanding all productive labor, commanding all people, because there weren't enough jobs to be filled. However, with time and with the construction of machines that would open up jobs for people who had to work on these machines that could expand industry uh, because more production was going to be had, with that, more and more people could be entered into the system. And because of that, they needed to be entered rather quickly. They couldn't, we couldn't waste time training them. They had to be put in front of a machine and made to do one task and that's it. So it took some time. It took the kind of accruement, the, um, the gathering of resources to the point that it allowed the capitalist system to put all these people to work. And that puts us here into chapter 15, machinery and large scale industry. So while the introduction of manufacturing was kind of one of the first moments of capitalist production, here we are going to see its development into a kind of full-fledged exploitative form. So one of the things that he begins this chapter by doing is really questioning the difference between the, a tool and a machine. And what is the difference between a tool and a machine? And it's a very good question, and I think that we get a similar one in Heidegger when he at, in the question concerning technology, but I'm not going to talk about that here, but it's a very interesting question. But before jumping into the question, he makes the point that machinery doesn't make life easier despite the claim that it, that it will make life easier, it'll free up labor for people. It instead just increases the amount of surplus labor that can be extracted from humans because humans are made more efficient alongside more efficient machines, which means that more time can be spent exploiting them because it'll cost less to cover the cost of their, their living and more than can be uh, justified in taking from them. Now, what is different between machines and tools that previous economic systems, previous systems would have used is that machines well, I should say first, machines don't get rid of tools. We're not talking about a total shift of the logic of tools, like a hammer or a screwdriver or whatever. Instead, we are seeing a multiplication of tools, an expansion of tools. And in a way, this is also corresponding to a quantitative rather than a qualitative shift. But I want to put a little asterisk here, and I don't want to say, you know, create this binary, it's either quantitative or qualitative. It's a little of both. But for now, Imagine it as rather um, an intensification of tools, the expansion of tools in one area. So for Marx, the machine, sorry, has three parts. It is comprised of the motor mechanism, which is the driving force of the mechanism. It is comprised of the transmitting mechanism. So these are the parts that distribute energy like ropes, pulleys, gears, etc. And then there's the working machine, which is the very apparatus and tools used by the handicraftsman or the manufacturing worker. So the machine replaces the worker and turns the worker into nothing different than the wind or the water that is used to keep the machine going, a force for the machine's operation. So the human is not an autonomous being in this setting. The human is just put to work to make the machine keep going, but they are very much necessary, as I think I've made clear in the previous episodes, you can't do away with labor entirely in favor of only automation, because for, for many, many reasons. But there is the possibility, and there's no denying the fact that machines will do away with labor to a certain extent, and it will have a very strong effect on that. So it is when machines can function without man's help and need also only supplementary assistance from the worker that we have an automatic system of machinery. 
where workers, you know, there only needs to be one trained person who may have gotten a few years of training to keep the machines going so that they can, you know, keep doing their thing. But of course, remember, no matter what, if all the machines have been automated, the only way those machines could have actually come into existence is if they were made through human labor. But if machines were made by machines, we can follow the track back down to the first machine and that would have had to have been made by labor. And to just say it briefly here, machines can't <laughs> become fully automated because if that were the case, there wouldn't be a population to buy the things the machines are producing. So with these types of machines, these nearly completely automated machines or these machines that are relying less and less upon human labor, what we see is the steady disintegration of handicrafting, handicraftsmanship, and manufacturing, as it was previously known, where, you know, you'd have a bunch of people working in a factory. Now we're seeing the number of those people dwindle in favor of more and more machines. And with this, we are introduced into large-scale industry, which gave birth not only to new, more advanced machines that were kind of made with already advanced machines, it also, that is large-scale industry, necessitated innovation in terms of communication and transport because more and more things were being made, which meant that, you know, people uh, domestically, let's say within a country, let's say within England, you know, more things were being made than the people needed. So this would open up the possibility for trade, more trade with other nations, which opened up more communication with other nations, means of communication, means of transport, opened up roads and highways and other ways to transport, all for uh, the capitalist system, you know, including like railways and telegraphs, ocean steamers, all that came out of the logic of trade, which of course was potentiated by these developments in manufacturing and the shift from manufacturing to large-scale industry. Now, machines participate differently in the process of valorization, that is the process of earning capital. As we mentioned in one of the previous episodes, a machine is going to work differently in that process than a tool. And that is because machines can often have uh, a longer lifespan and they can be employed more economically and more efficiently. But still, a machine won't do much for a capitalist if it only earns as much as was put into it or that it cost. So if it costs a thousand dollars to buy a machine and that machine is going to be responsible to make a thousand items, you have to charge at least a dollar on each of those items in order to cover the cost of the machine. But you can't, as we already mentioned, you can't really charge much more because then competition won't be able to occur or, or you will be undercut by competition and so on. So a machine has to be, uh, you still have to make a profit on the machine or else it'll be useless for you. But one of the ways that capitalists were able to recoup the cost of the machine was that it reduced the value of labor because labor became more productive, which means that less of it was needed. So the capitalists could say, we don't need that many people. And there are quite a few people now needing work because, uh, you know, we still have this population and many of them have been have lost their jobs because of the introduction of machinery, because machinery takes over quite a few people's jobs. So now there is less demand for labor, but the supply of laborers has gone way up. So these people are desperate. They're willing to work for less. Families then have to employ uh, children. They have to employ uh, women as well in order to work, perhaps elderly people, people who otherwise wouldn't be able to work, like sick people and so on, have to be put to work in order to cover the cost that has been lost to the worker to feed you know, themselves and their family. Now, one of the things here that I think is worth pointing out is that Marx uh, has a very romantic idea about what a family should be, and of course he's writing this in a way that only positions the nuclear family as the only viable uh, familial form, where women are meant to be working in the home, they're meant to be, and he describes it in quite in a lot of detail, they're supposed to be delicate and beautiful, and all of that is threatened when they have to go and work in factories. And he laments the fact that factories harden women, which of course is a problematic axiom upon which to base your argument, to say that the reason capitalism should be opposed, at least in its treatment of women, is because it somehow goes against a kind of real womanly essence, being that of uh, fragile and delicate so that's just something to be mindful of when, when looking at this. 
and of course Marx had his own prejudices and this is like it's just good to keep um to keep that criticism that line of criticism open but in any case the point is quite good in that it is requiring more and more people to work for less and less money in the factory in order just to stay alive or in industry just to stay alive or and i would like to add that in it's problematic and i'm obviously not a fan of this uh similarity here but he Marx then likens the worker that is the man of the house to uh, a slave dealer because he has to sell his wife and children to the capitalist and it's like well is that really the same same thing as slavery is it is it really but in any case this is what he gives us so Marx obviously dislikes this for the um just the poor working conditions as well children women men are forced to work in even more and more deplorable conditions because the capitalist these people are struggling to work they're struggling to work wherever they can the capitalist doesn't care so they obviously aren't going to spend money to make the conditions good for the people and the machinery 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 jesus will also encourage people to work longer days because machine machines will wear out in a lot of cases from natural factors so the capitalist wants to work it absolutely to its limit as much as possible never capitalist never wants the machine to stop so people have to work all hours of the day long hours weird hours in order to keep the machines always going now in some cases working days might actually decrease for workers so instead of for example there being two shifts of 12 hours where uh, the all 24 hours are covered maybe now the 24 hours is covered in three shifts of eight hours so the working day is decreased but the intensity of that work has often increased because people are forced to match the rhythms of these machines that go at a, an unrealistic pace and here we are presented with a new antagonism a kind of new um, dialectic that is not just between workers and capitalists but also now between workers and machines and there are numerous examples in history of, of labor disputes where people destroy machinery and it is more than just uh more than just trying to affect or attack the capital of the capitalist there's a kind of real antagonism there a, a real hatred towards maybe even a specific machine and with growing industry it is worth noting because this is obviously a very complicated issue and economics is just generally quite complicated as more and more industries are opening up that means there are going to be more and more positions for people to occupy but that doesn't change the fact that these positions are still the demand is still going to be much less than the supply of workers and it also means that there are going to be more so-called unproductive positions opening up so as more and more wealth is accumulated by fewer and fewer people those people those wealthy people are going to be hiring more and more workers to do what is called unproductive labor that is working as maybe a butler or a maid or a cook for uh, a capitalist that doesn't do anything to actually increase a nation's wealth according and this is goes right back to adam smith these workers are not doing anything to sell to make and sell products that can then increase the overall wealth of a society instead these workers are just working for a capitalist for someone who has accrued a great deal of wealth and this machinery this development of large-scale industry exacerbates and intensifies the cycle of capitalism that goes as follows that is there's moderate activity of production there is prosperity there's then overproduction there's then a crisis and stagnation and then it all repeats over again now because machinery participates in making things even faster and making things more efficiently it speeds up this cycle because i don't think it takes someone uh, with a higher education degree or anything like that to know that it is simply unsustainable that is the extraction of resources from the earth the extraction of wealth from people or surplus labor from people even though and this isn't true but even though it might appear at first glance like that is not happening in the so-called west or the global north much of this is still occurring in places overseas in places in bangladesh and other parts of asia where labor is being exploited to such a great extent that people are forced into um kind of indentured servitude that is they have no other choice than to work for pennies for 
a capitalist, which is just the result of years of exploitation, years of colonization and imperialism that have created these conditions that have placed millions, perhaps even upwards of billion or billions of people in this position. Now, the global nature of capitalism, and we'll talk about this more in the next episode, contributes to then global crises, global moments of stagnation, which is why the 2008 financial crash that originated in part from bad loans being given out to people in the United States had ripple effects all throughout Europe and all throughout the world, which only served in the end to make quite a few people even richer while disenfranchising more and more people. And this turn, and I've jumped quite a bit thinking about 2008 when we really we're talking about large-scale industry from quite a few centuries ago, but this turn to large-scale industry makes competition very difficult. So small manufacturers, small producers have a very hard time competing. The old form of apprenticeship and guilds have a very hard time competing with the big, uh, big production companies, big industry. And we see this play out today where it's very difficult for new shops or new uh, anything to compete against Amazon or Walmart or anything like that, which goes against, even according to Ricardo and Smith, it goes against the spirit of capitalism itself because it is the formation of monopolies, essentially, a kind of oligopoly that resists the potential for competition. But anyways, I digress slightly. Now, in response to the harsh conditions of uh, these factories, many different legislative attempts were made to curb the um, the poor settings, the kind of exploitative and decrepit settings of the factory. And one of them, and Marx goes through quite a few, but one of them would be called was called the Factory Acts that sought to you know limit the working day to increase wages and all that. So obviously capitalists were opposed to that, and it also sought to um, make it illegal to hire children, which goes without saying, definitely should be the case. You shouldn't be able to hire children. But because capitalism moved so quickly and it developed so fast, it made it difficult for legislation to actually keep up. And we're seeing this still occur to this day, and especially on uh, with the emergence of what I believe Nick Cernicek calls platform capitalism. So with Uber and other kinds of Airbnb and, and um, all of these other internet platforms that are used in favor of capitalist um, the capitalist accumulation of wealth, but that is very difficult to legislate and to uh, control or to have a grappling of in order to curb exploitation because they, you know, these platforms just emerge almost overnight and then they take over, uh, they take over the entire economy so quickly and it's very difficult then to actually get ahead of it, let you know, understand it and then get ahead of it in terms of regulation. Now, despite the move to make workers more malleable, make workers more free in factories to do any kind of job, so they aren't limited by having to do apprenticeship, having to go through guilds or any of these regulations or anything like that, capitalism opens up the potential for people to do many different jobs. And we're seeing the same thing today with the gig economy, where people are encouraged to work wherever they want, but nevertheless, they are still working for somebody else. So on the one hand, it appears as though there's a kind of liberation from old forms of control, old forms of regulation, but it still maintains many of these old forms of control, of hierarchization, of uh, regulating people so as to limit their potential. So it was in the capitalist interest at the time, you know, a few centuries ago, we're talking about and even very much today, to have their workers be uneducated. And because if you had uneducated workers, you could have them doing simple tasks without them questioning anything. And there's a whole section in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations when he's talking about how it is in the capitalist interest to have a smart population when history shows that that is absolutely not the case. It were, was governments that said, no, kids need to be educated and the years would change. But at the time, you know, up till the age of 13 or 12, I believe, they had to be in school. They had to be learning things. They had to have a basic understanding of math, writing, uh, all of these different things in order to make them smart, to be able to have some kind of critical capacity. Now, the effects of large-scale industry extend beyond just factories into agricultural industries as well. So what we saw then is also a kind of what, what Marx calls a new and higher synthesis based on science and efficiency between agriculture and industry, where some of the logics of industry that 
were really forming the kind of roots of the division of labor, even though we could see this in agriculture beforehand as well, but it's where it really came into fruition, could then be applied against agriculture. So the effects of this were twofold. It concentrates the historical mode of power of society in a kind of division of labor type of way as the accumulation of wealth, the search for capital, and the accumulation of capital, and so on. And it also disturbs the metabolic interaction between man and the earth, the relationship between humans and the earth. And this is also something we get in Heidegger when he, in the question concerning technology, when instead of the relationship being one of, maybe I'll just say to make it simple, of respect with the earth and the earth's resources, it becomes now just a matter of extraction, pure ab extraction almost for the sake of extraction. We take and take and take without considering what, what that might be doing to the earth. Now, all of this reveals the extent to which capitalism is anathema. It is opposed to the two first or the two kind of original sources of wealth, and that is labor and the soil or, and the earth. So people, that is labor, are required to make value, are required to produce wealth. But we see time and time again how capitalism fights against that wealth, that, that source of wealth. And it also fights against the earth as being the other source of possible wealth, the other source of possible value. And that puts us here into part five, uh, which we'll cover in the next episode and conclude the book in the next episode. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed what I did here. If there's anything I excluded or anything I mischaracterized, I would love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? I might be able to sway them into not seeing Marxism as a super evil uh, boogeyman thing. Um, and yeah, take care.